Why hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 561. I think it's 561, it should be 561, if it isn't 561, I do apologise greatly. But thank you for joining me once again. If you're watching this via YouTube, hmm, is it me or does my camera look slightly bent? Like, I know I'm at a weird angle anyway, I'm having to do this weird cranking my neck thing. Don't don't mind that. But in terms of the level, am I like that? It feels like I'm like this. No, it feels like I'm, like, I'm there or something. It feels like I'm like on a slant. I know the angle's weird, don't forget the angle, but just like the actual, am I, what's that called? Am I horizontal? Am I like a 90 degree angle here, down here or not? I don't feel like I am down there at like some sort of 90 degree angle. It feels like I'm like off a little bit. But let me know in the comments. If you listen via audio, you will not care, innit? You will not care. That's a beauty of actually listening to a podcast via audio format. The actual way it's meant to be listened to. I've actually noticed, this isn't a plug, which is a plug really. I've actually noticed I have a different cadence and the way that I kind of speak and the way that I kind of formulate my ideas is a lot different when I'm doing my Patreon episode, which will be out at the end of the week. If you haven't signed up already, make sure you sign up to the Patreon, patreon.com for just Agostino to sign up on there. It's only one pound, equivalent of one dollar. What are you waiting for? One bonus episode per week. Get involved, get in tune, jump on board. But I have noticed when I'm not recording via video and it's just via audio because the Patreon's only audio, it does give it something else. It gives it another little feel. And obviously I'm a little bit more X-rated over there, but still I get a different sort of feel overall there. I really, really do. Like it legitimately, you know, maybe it's because again, I prefer the medium that way. That's how I used to listen to podcasts back in the day. Um, the only really one I used to really watch on video ever was Joe Rogan. That would be it. And mostly the fight companions. Apart from that, I'd kind of skip the rest of them in terms of watching them on video. Because I guess most of the time, I, at that time too, I was working a lot of jobs that were service industry jobs where I'd basically be in, you know, in stock rooms or whatnot, on shop floor some time or running behind or running around here and there. So usually you can maybe sneak the odd headphone in and listen to a bit of Joe Rogan in it. So it's probably better to kind of do that via the audio format because you'd probably get through a lot more of the episode than you would sitting down and watching the video because you've got no time really um so you'd probably sneak a listen on the way there sneak a listen at lunch sneak a listen when you're working sneak a listen on the way back and by the time you get back home you've already listened to a three hour podcast you know throughout the day in like little 20 minute 10 minute chunks or whatnot but yeah you know whatever who cares but yeah, we're back, we're back. Um, hope you're well, wherever this may find you. Middle of the week type vibes. Um, you know, still stuff is going off in a big way in Ukraine. Unfortunately, I happen to have a um, penchant or a desire to see things that are actually occurring there. I think most people are just reading the headlines or seeing the reports on the news, which is fair, you know, fair enough, you can do that. But I like to dig a bit deeper. And the consequence of that is that I end up seeing stuff I probably shouldn't see, especially before I go to bed. And I've seen some really crazy videos of like, you know, I saw a video of an elderly couple who got completely, you know, held, got completely, um, uh, covered in a hail of bullets on on the side of a road, still in a car. The car's all mashed up, like horrible to see. There's the other video going around that's viral now at the moment with a family that completely, basically got the whole family got executed except for like one dog. Another, yeah, there are two dogs. One dog survived. The other dog is obviously um, passed away, and they've all been pushed into a ditch on the side of the road, and the car's just there. And then one of the dogs is just laying by the side of their owner like not moving looking really sad like ugh, it's honestly it's awful really 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 awful stuff to watch um but again man i think weirdly enough similar to the pandemic right weirdly enough similar to the pandemic this is a really strange point to make but i feel like for us especially people who live in the west myself included who live in you know supposed developed countries um who have for the most part lived a life of you know relative privilege i think we've all got a form of privilege even myself you know being a black man i think we all have forms of privilege especially when we're living you know um in a society where we have you know decent internet we're able to come back and forth to work we have a social group that cares and loves for us we have a family that we maybe love that doesn't care about us we're able to go out and nights out we're able to go on holiday we're able to buy things for ourselves we're able to whatever the things that we enjoy to do we're able to do them with relative ease I feel like sometimes I feel like actually the pandemic was an actual wake up call for a lot of us, myself included, to kind of grow up. And I feel like watching what's going on in Ukraine for some of us who haven't been as politically engaged as we should be, 
myself included in some respects but for the most people who kind of don't really see the humanity in people unless they look like you if they're white and blonde blonde blue eyes i think it's beneficial to see that to see it in real time to see you know a society that was somewhat you know democratic um a, a society that was somewhat normal quote unquote actually being you know torn apart by a tyrannical ruler in terms of putin right who just wants to do it because he wants to do it right there's no real rhyme or reason why it's been going on for far longer than what we've seen i think like eight plus years right they've been going back and forth but essentially we're seeing it in real time we're seeing a society we're seeing a country being basically brought to its knees the great thing to see is that they're fighting back that's been brilliant to see as like you know in terms of seeing what actual courage looks like in terms of actually seeing what actual patriotism looks like as well because we get a really skewed view of what patriotism looks like from americans when they're screaming and shouting at somebody at a flipping denny's and they don't want to wear a mask or they're you know ranting and raving about QAnon, ranting and raving about trump and he won the election that's the way we see patriotism we don't really see it any other way maybe if you watch football you might see somebody really bellowing out the national anthem and that's about it but this is what patriotism looks like right despite i'm sure in ukraine day to day there are things that people don't like about the government they don't like about the country they don't like about that society how they're treated but for the most part the ones that have been called to bear arms especially the men have responded or even the women who are basically just you know looking after the children looking after the old everyone has responded to the call of action everyone's responded to um this need for everyone to kind of step up and defend their home country even if it's going to be in vain they've all decided to step up and i think it generally has been amazing to see it's amazing to see like what heroism actually looks like what selfishness actually looks like especially in the world that we're living in today with pure unbridled selfishness right we're seeing celebrities and regular people just you know doing the most um you know addicted to the viral virus uh continually putting themselves in the middle of controversy in terms of generating clicks and attention and engagement it's been fun for a bit but after a while it gets a little bit you know tiresome right and it's good to actually see real life people responding to real life tragedies and stepping up when needed because it allows you to maybe be a little bit more humble to be a little bit more appreciative of the position that you're in the place that you you're born in um society that you live in the government that's you know basically rules over you that maybe isn't as bad or what's going or maybe isn't as bad or maybe the neighboring countries that you live next to that aren't as bad as what russia's doing to ukraine bloody blah 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 um there is some slight benefit to come from it but still it's an absolute tragedy really it's so watching this in real time the videos and i think you know it's been a double-edged sword obviously with the advent of smartphones and whatnot we are seeing this stuff in real time there's whole subreddits twitter accounts telegrams and you know channels of people just sharing everything that's been going on over there obviously you know with some spec um in included but for the most part it's just ugh just just horrible really really horrible you know and you don't really see it ending in any sort of like um you don't really see it ending anytime soon you're suddenly going to get worse before it gets better just kind of send out prayers man to everybody out there really sending out prayers to everybody out there um you know and everybody out there in the world actually they're suffering that's the thing to keep in mind because at the moment everyone kind of has been glued and kind of hooked into kind of extending their sympathies to people in ukraine but there are many people out there suffering you know there's afghanis out there suffering israeli people out there suffering palestinians out there suffering yemeni people out there suffering um people in the uk out here suffering as that kid going around you know various different um london boroughs and exposing the terrible housing conditions people are living in with like mold infesting you know houses and people developing respiratory you know viruses and diseases and shit like horrible stuff stuff that i've seen myself in growing up in ends growing up in a place where i'd had to kind of wash with a flipping you know bucket and a cup and stuff you know what i mean and washing in a place where the, the the bathtub is shaking or the walls are melting and stuff and having the council not give a crap like it's hard do you know what I mean really hard and you're seeing people kind of respond to it and really see that you know as bad as you may think you have it day to day there are people who have it out there worse so humble can take a step back relax don't don't be the main character of your own story don't be the main character of your own movie because life truly doesn't care about you in that regard and just appreciate what you have that's what it is, the, the name of the game for everything i think even that's the name of the that's actually a lesson of covid anyway overall pandemic times has always been appreciation because we've been you know especially during the peak of the pandemic we were you know under lock and key we couldn't go out here this restriction there curfew there depending on where you live and as soon as they decided to let us have little liberties that are you know 
how God given or not God given, but you know, li- liberties that we should be entitled to regardless, right? But they make it seem as it's a treat. We start to appreciate the small things. We start to appreciate being able to meet up with our friends, grab a coffee, have a sandwich, go to a club, have some dinner, go for a walk, whatever. Little things we start to appreciate more. We start to, even myself, I started to, you know, my wanderlust, I still have, don't get me wrong. I like to travel and go to different places, but the wanderlust of like, escapism from my regular drudgery of my day-to-day is kind of left me now i'm not really trying to run away anywhere i want to go places to enjoy them but it's not like an escape from my day-to-day hell and that's mostly been a consequence of pandemic it's kind of allowed me to be a little bit more chill and just relax a bit you know not take life too not be um too wrapped up in you know temporary situations that can easily be changed if i decide to do a b and c so yeah thoughts and feelings go out to everybody in crane um heads up hopefully um for the ones fighting and for the ones on the front line you know keep doing your thing for the ones out there supporting everybody on the outside keep doing your thing also nothing but respect for everybody out there nothing but respect we continue so um another update quick i wanted to mention this is concerning my football team manchester united there's been a long-running theme going on at the moment with people that have kind of been paying attention and keeping their third eye open that for whatever reason darren fletcher one of our ex-players and somebody who i regard a bit of a legend at the club and somebody who's clearly wants to have a future behind the scenes somewhere somehow or the other was um appointed alongside with john murto as sort of like the new footballing structure of our club because for the longest time we didn't have a director of football director of football usually from what i understand are people who kind of oversee the overall uh, you know vision of a football club and say hey you know here's my goal or here's a goal for the club or what we're trying to do the type of player we want to bring in the type of football we want to play the trophies we want to compete for and then with with that kind of vision you're able to make some easy decisions sensible decisions going forward in terms of transfers and player acquisitions managerial hires coaches um you know who to sell they're all kind of informed by the overall vision but it's very important now in football because every club has it like literally you know the brentfords the sheffield united the aston villas the leicester cities they're all run really well and when you run really well it allows you to to kind of chop and change managers like how Chelsea do and you also allows you to have the best opportunity to be able to win trophies because you can attract the best players because you play the best brand of football you're competing for stuff blah blah you know the standard thing we haven't had that United we've been kind of relying on managers to come in and fix problems we're always looking for a savior and we finally fixed things you know we've got John Murtaugh include involved made him the director of football essentially and had Darren Fletcher to be the their technical director now joe murta situation's funny because supposedly i don't know if this is true but i've read that he's been at the club since david moses at the club and if you know that anything about my united you know david moses hired him many 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 years ago more than five or six seven years ago so joe murta's been at the club since then we haven't really seen any positive change in the club in terms of the football structure and how we buy players since 2000 whenever he was in there he now gets a job so it's a kind of an inside job it's not like we went and hired the best director of football we gave it to somebody who doesn't really know what he's doing um or clearly hasn't shown any acumen to be really good at his job then we get somebody to assist him who hasn't got any experience in that role whatsoever but usually technical directors of football are kind of always ex-pros who are able to kind of maybe be a liaison between like new players and club and maybe maybe to sell the club to new players or to youth team players you know it's, i understand the kind of um sentimental nature of it but you would assume if you're going to have a sentimental role for one person, maybe the person next to them needs to be actually good at their job to kind of offset it, right? If you're going to do nepotism, similar sort of thing, don't have the nepotism guy be the CEO, at least let him be the flipping CTO and then have the main CTO or CEO guy be like a legit person. We didn't do that. And then all of a sudden he gets hired in that role and then suddenly he's on the bench. He's taking training, he's doing rondos and, you know, like we didn't make no sense. Why is he on the bench? Why is he always taking training and, you know, doing little piggy in the middle kind of training drills with the players if he's meant to be the technical director? And also we've got this other thing going on with, you know, at the moment our interim co- interim coach in Ralph Ragnick, who's supposed to be meant to go into a consultancy role after he finishes this interim role. But then he's overqualified for that role because he's got more experience than, um, what you call it, than um, Murto and Flipping Fletcher combined. Makes no sense. So everyone's been asking, what is Darren Fletcher's role? What is he doing at the club? Ralph Ragnick, because he's German and because of his personality, probably, he just, you know, says it as it is. One day he came out and basically said he has no idea what Darren Fletcher's role is in relation to the club. But in terms of helping him out, he helps out with training and coaching and he's a vital part of his team. But, you know, basically exposed a part of it. Like, you know, again, we are, we don't know what we're doing. 
and we're hiring people in jobs that they don't know what they're doing in that role and they're not the best in class. So it's been a common theme. But again, I mean, if you say it too loud, some of the top reds will tell you to shut up because, you know, you were not meant to question the club's decisions making, even though we've been clearly woeful in that respect. But out of the blue, he kind of decided to come out and basically say what he does because of all the pressure, I think, again, on social media. So part of why I wanted to mention it was that it does sometimes feel as if like when you're commenting or when I'm commenting or even us as fans in general are commenting about United online, especially on the Twitter spaces, it sometimes does feel like we're like shouting into the void like no one's listening to us but i feel like nowadays especially with how linked social media and twitter and instagram all these things are with football nowadays right Ent entire marketing campaigns are you know built around the social media campaigns people are able to you know you know use social media numbers to in increase their you know weekly salaries and you know it plays a huge part i think because of that clubs and now have no alternative but to have keep an eye out and basically have somebody maybe monitoring and seeing what the current what the consensus is on social media so even though they use it to manipulate the fan base i feel especially at united they do for sure especially with the hiring of that guy i forgot his name um who's basically been hired from the sun to basically help united out in terms of pr what's his actual name let me find it out um man united pr is it pr guy who is this no uh media guy yes that's from the guardian they hired him what was his name higher Manchester united higher what's that mention of higher pr what is his name again neil ashton that's his name they hired that neil ashton guy that kind of cock who used to pronounce um who used to print out who used to kind of present i think the sunday supplement on sky sports so now he's basically in charge of basically you know handling the pr or oh, basically his pr firm has been hired to take over for the pr i guess from the youth for, for united anyway changes we moved um Dan Fletcher finally explained what he does. He says as follows, a quote, he said as follows, with Ralph and his coaching staff coming in and Michael and Kieran choosing to move on, we had a quick transition process. So part of my role has been to assist with that, both on training ground, on training pitch training during games, which is weird because essentially it means he's doing Nicky Butt's role, well, Nicky Butt left, isn't it, right? Nicky Butt left United. Let's see what he said when he left. Nicky Butt um, leaves coaching, leaves role. Man United, let's see what was said here. I do remember Nicky Butt left. Nicky Butt left Manchester United after becoming irritated at the club. Nicky Butt left Man United after years of becoming irritated at the club. Following his retirement, Esmond first spent that year, exactly. So he left because he was irritated, right, about the structure, about maybe not being had the opportunities to leave. Let's see what he says, actually. Let's see. Explain to here the MEN. Mentioning even uses usually a bit of a crappy website to get information from. But let's see what they say. Um, uh, what do you say? He says here, yeah. Uh, he says the following it wasn't a wrench to go if I'm honest I love the club always have but I knew it was my time to leave and maybe get new challenges and start something different he says here uh, what else does he say move on come on go away I accepted you um, what he says the follows not at all I was comfortable with my job comfortable with my surroundings it was just a personal choice to leave the club okay he didn't really say much but anyway we essentially got Darren Fletcher to replace Nicky Butt even though he has less experience than Nicky Butt in the actual role and then we have him doing what? Not the job he's been hired to do, but spending time on a training pitch, which is taking time away from doing the actual job that he needs to do, which in actuality, if you think about it, the issues that we have are far, you know, they actually structural level have need more attention than him being actually on the bench. It's a complete waste of time. That's the point of it. It's like, I never, I never understood that. But I'm just happy to see that in some regard, the pressure from the fans has been somewhat felt from the club and they're feeling the pressure the only thing that i would want the next step would be to f make more pressure on the club and get the glazers out the glazers are our owners who are complete dog shit i want them out of the club because i think my personal opinion is that you can't restructure the club as they did and basically you know even this joe moto don pleasure thing they've got they're reporting still to the bankers who are part of the glazers who don't know what they're doing so there's not really been any real change really for the most of it they just kind of restructured it but everyone's still reporting to the same people the only way it really changes the only way we kind of become successful again is if the glazers go i don't think there's any possibility unless we find the next reincarnation of Silas Ferguson, who can basically be a manager, who can do all the things that Saf did when he was at the club and basically drag us kicking and screaming to victory, despite how poorly run we are. If we don't find that person, which is unlikely, because that's a one in a million, right? That's why Saf is the greatest of all time. 
then we're going to have to wait many years until we become successful or maybe wait for other clubs to just, you know, go down the, down the drain some, some way. Because I don't think it happens. I don't think we can get success despite how shit we are. So structurally wise, it's not going to happen. And the only way to change this is to get the Glazers out of the club. But will they leave? Will they sell? I don't think so. That's too much of a cash cow, easy money. Uh, the pre there's no pressure from the fans. The top breasts don't seem to want to protest. The fans don't want to protest either. They all believe that we just need to get Declan Rice in and Haaland and suddenly we're going to compete for the title. It's not going to work like that. None of our none of the players we signed so far have been saviors have worked out. Even Bruno Fernandes, you know, zero. None of them have worked out in terms of really, you know, coming back and changing our fortunes of the club overall. It never works out like that. Everyone always kind of reverts to the mean. Um, and yeah, that situation. That's it basically with United. I just went to mention that because it pissed me off. And then quickly moving on to this one. This is courtesy of the Fright and the Kids subreddit, of course. And I just wanted to quickly mention this because, you know, you know, I'm a big fan of Brendan Shaw on this podcast. <laughs> um, I heard him mention something, or I saw this clip on the Fright and the Kids subreddit where he essentially bemoans, you know, um, haters and haters, as he likes to say, and talks about how they don't have a life and how they're losers and blah, 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 blah. blah. You know, the, the common soundbite that kind of comes from a guy like that. And it just got me thinking overall, um, why is it people like him and i think joe rogan to some extent i don't think he does it a lot because i think he's smart enough to not always kind of poke that haters our uh, losers and sort of stuff because at the end of the day it's just going to bring unnecessary you know trolls to your account you don't want to keep telling people that they're idiots who watch you because you know they're, they're going to come out and start saying stuff so just leave it alone and i think for the most part he's aware that he doesn't have that many haters really he has people that want to cancel him especially in the mainstream media because he makes a lot of money but for the most part he's not really got haters the way that brendan does you know people legitimately don't like brendan um he probably represents everything they hate in society in terms of being you know not very good at his job but still immensely successful and rich and all this stuff i don't know what it is but there is something underlying about him as a person that people despise to the to the core that, that they just can't stop reminding themselves why they hate him so much and it's so visceral and it's made me question because i think to myself hasn't he ever wondered in his brain why people hate him so much like there's a 50 i think at the, at the last point of checking if i'm not mistaken the yeah the the fire and the kids subreddit is at fifty six thousand plus people right again a lot of those people are grandfathered in because they were fans of the show but originally when they joined the subreddit but as um Ariel Hawani so eloquently mentioned one time those guys initially most of them are guys were definitely fans of the show first so they started out as fans and then his personality was so grating that they then turn into haters now i know a lot of the subreddits of podcasts do end up being that way i think a good example is cool her daddy there was a point when the cool her daddy subreddit was full of praise the bon appetit the youtube channel same sort of thing they were full of praise for the people that hosted that show and then it turns but usually it turns because of you know for a reason it doesn't turn out the blue um the cooler daddy it turned because the girls ended up having a falling out and you know that drama ensued people had to pick their sides and the bon appetit thing same sort of thing right they had a big scandal there in terms of representation all this sort of stuff and people rep you know response to it you know basically dictated who fell in what lane who fell in what camp you know basically that's what happened so there's always a turn there's always an event and I feel like sometimes if you're conscious enough, if you're, there's two ways to go about it. Either you just ignore it completely, this, these communities like Joe Rogan does. He doesn't, I don't think he probably has checked his subreddit ever in his life. He just care, doesn't care. Probably has somebody filtering back some stuff that he needs to know about. Cool. Or you do like a Lex Friedman and you police your own subreddit. I think Lex Friedman, Lex Friedman set up his own Lex um, subreddit. He bans people all the time on there. If you, if you don't say nothing he likes on there. And if for the most part, it's very, police this but like obviously people are like you know it's kind of it's strict if you say too many things that kind of divert or kind of you know sound a bit hatey they'll kind of take you out straight away but to kind of suddenly say everyone that comments on you or that has anything bad to say about you is a loser it's just strange it's really strange i never and again i just think because there's so many people on that subreddit has it ever do you think crossed his mind to think why do they hate me and is there anything that i could do or is there anything that they're saying that's got merit don't get me wrong i don't think he should go on the subreddit and try to win people over that's never going to happen because at this point he's a low cow in the same way that wings and dsp and these kind of guys right you know, dsp are the ones i kind of dark side feel i hate the most in terms of being a terrible content um creator out there and somebody who clearly scamming and taking advantage of these kind of um fans and their generosity 
But in general, when you see Wings get on live stream and try and talk to his fans or try and talk to his distractors about stuff, it doesn't necessarily work. Now, it does obviously a lot of those guys, their personalities and the lack of accountability and the lack of self-awareness, just grating, right? Especially Wings of Redemption. Like, there's nothing. That he, he can always explain everything away. Everything was because he was young, because it was a shock jock. He never takes responsibility for, you for anything. Even just the other day, I saw a video of Wings Redemption saying that he basically, um, what, he, the only reason why he's so fat and overweight, I think he's like 470 pounds, is because he drinks too much soda supposedly thinks he puts on he thinks he put on 40 pounds just because of soda alone and it's like bruv you're on live stream all the time we just saw a video of you the other day eating a pizza at 4 a.m in the morning don't you think that contributed to your 40 pounds but anyway this is a clip of brendan basically talking about the haters and saying well how he doesn't get them and they're all whatever losers let's play the clip like you're, you're just the like imagine the biggest loser in your school just the negative kid if you're walking down the hallway and you're like Pfft cool shoes you're like excuse me you're the worst kid in the school dude you wouldn't give a fuck but now all those losers have a place to you know like oh i'm a loser you're a loser let's get together you know so they they can they have a, a tribe you know you also said hurt people hurt people so I yes. mean, who knows what they're going through but still stop doing it this doesn't shit. matter yeah, stop doing it this doesn't shit. matter it's just not a winner's mentality. You know, you're never going to get out of your mom's basement doing this stuff. You yeah, got to get something. out of there. Get a girl. Do something. Do something. Do anything. Challenge yourself, yeah. Yeah, create your own content, man. Do your own shit. Whatever it is, man. Yeah. It's a weird thing to say, I think, because it's not, you know, I, I, I'm a fairly well-adjusted human. You know, I have a job. I stay in my own place, not my parents' basement. I've had girls. I've got girls. Like I do, I, I, I've got friends. I've got a social group. Like, I don't understand this idea that everyone that's commenting negative things or maybe calling you out on your BS online is somehow a, you know, Cheeto dust fingered, you know, wings of redemption looking like neckbeard. It's not the truth. Like, this is when you put that content online you have to expect to get positive and negative reactions it's just going to happen it just is what it is if you say if you talk about enough enough stuff online myself included people are going to have either a positive or a negative reaction to you or a non-plus reaction just keep it moving but if they want to say something back it doesn't mean that they are now especially if it's negative that it's immediately invalid and it immediately means that person's a loser and immediately means what they have to say has no worth that they're a homeless cat like no that's not how the life goes and nowadays i don't think especially with the access and the ease of which you can comment on things you can downvote you can like you can share you can quote tweet it doesn't take too long to you know grab your phone whilst you're in a meeting or on zoom or in the toilet and just quickly leave a comment say oh that's a dumb clip brendan sounds like that sounds like an idiot why can't he pronounce walk why can't why does he think there's a river that runs through the Amazon? Like, it's easy to just comment those things and just say it. It doesn't require any brain power. And I think a lot of people who are on that subreddit aren't people who are unemployed, aren't people who are starving, aren't people who are, you know, sexless and don't fag chicks, as this guy says. Like, no, they're just regular guys that don't like you as a person. And for whatever reason, he's never, he's never wrangled with the idea about why he doesn't, why he's not liked. Because I think in general, in my opinion, I've always thought the actual best content that creators out there, I think of people like, like them or hate them, the poor brothers, right? I think the reason why they're so good at what they do is because they're aggressively, ferociously self-aware. Like they know exactly why people don't like them. And for the most part, they double down and lean into it. But they know why. They're aware why people don't like them. I think for the, some to some extent, you could say maybe Jake has made more of an uh, is it Jake the older one, whoever the older one is, he's made more of an adjustment to kind of be more likable, right? But the younger one is still like you know on the line, trolling people, saying crazy shit. Like he doesn't care because he's not. But I'm sure he's aware why people don't like him, and he's leading into it and monetized it for himself. But for whatever reason, this redact can't do it. He's, he's incapable of doing it to the point where now he's got this approach when it comes to content creation where he doesn't look at comments i don't read comments i don't do this i don't do that no you should read your comments brother 
you should maybe see what people are saying you should maybe gauge how people are responding to your shows maybe gauge what they don't like what they did like like it's it, it might help and inform what you're doing and i've always said from the beginning i think if you would just be more aware and lean into it from the beginning from the onset i think this whole trouble started from that ama and how negative responded to that and maybe you know yeah maybe it was started with the negative turn when he shared that story about him throwing his teammate in they used to play football with through a glass window or whatnot right got caduce through a window maybe that was the whole point but he never at one point kind of had realized or kind of came to some sort of conclusion as to or maybe just thought about it for a second like why do people hate me it never never ever crossed his mind and it's just funny that for whatever reason especially that ellie podcasting scene especially the people within the rogan's orbit they seem to have this idea that if they put out content and people don't like it it's because they're haters and if they're haters it means that they're unemployed losers that don't have sex with women it's like what like can i just like not like your special can i just not think you're funny can i think humping a chair isn't comedy can i think maybe you have some redacted opinions am i just allowed to say that just move on and just continue my day go on to my job go back to my family like, it's pretty easy to do we see Brendan doing all the time. Whenever we see pictures of him and his family and really hanging around, he's always on his phone. It's easy to be on your phone and just be around your family or doing your work or at your job and still throw an opinion out there. It's not that difficult. I never understand why he says these kind of things. It's really bizarre. Really, really bizarre. And then the other thing I wanted to quickly mention was this clip about um, his inability to say repercussions. Um, and for whatever reason, he says repercussions. Oh, his face is super inflamed here. But what's what's this about? the whole mispronunciation of things is this or even me i just said it badly there the whole mispronunciation of things is this like a consequence of cte does he have a legit speech impediment and if he does have a speech impediment i've always found it interesting when people especially when you meet foreigners who are like learning english the best ones i love are the ones who like speak english even though when they're learning english they speak english with the same veracity and the same fast cadence as they would speak their native like tongue i love that shit like it's like i don't care i'm just gonna get these words out you're gonna figure it out on the fly but this guy's not he's not foreign he's, he's native speaking english and whatever it may be went to college supposedly graduated supposedly right why is he incapable of pronouncing normal standard words like i've seen many things it's like it blows my mind how he just can't pronounce stuff and this is him basically talking about you know if haters say something and they bump into you on like if you bump into a hater there'll be repercussions but just hear how he says repercussions repercussions obviously you'll see with the clip um what it means but it's just weird isn't it how, how he says it it's just really weird it, it, the problem is there's no consequence like if already did that to me you're gonna get your ass whooped yeah. especially around my kids there's gonna be repercussions that's mm. the problem he knows bert's not gonna do anything yeah you do that to rogan there's gonna be repercussions yeah you do that to tom it's probably gonna be repercussions but bert's so fun and playful that bert repercussions like what the fuck does that mean i don't know anyway let's move on from that one um quickly went to mention this is a courtesy of ticketmaster looks like wireless festival is happening 2022 very interesting lineup to say the least especially for the people who are playing it's sponsored by go puff i don't know what the fuck go puff is uh, but whatever go puff is are hosting i don't want presenting wireless it's now across three different locations which is a if ever you end an indication as to how much the entertainment sector or hospitality or event sector has suffered as a consequence of the pandemic or just artists in general look at all these legacy acts look at all these established festivals and look at how much of a bonanza they're trying to throw in terms of festivals to try and recoup all of the monies that they basically missed out for the last couple of years stuff like primavera coachella you know wireless festival like they're putting that even the weekend the amount of dates he's doing you can tell people have like really you know their pockets have been hurting because they haven't been able to perform and see their fans and go around the world and whatnot because this is an incredibly stacked lineup and a really big operation they're putting together so wireless festival for 2022 is split across three different venues in three different locations crystal palace park finsbury park and birmingham if i'm not mistaken it's moved to crystal palace park now in it i think that's a new location so or maybe Finsbury park i don't know which one somewhere one or the other so they're now split across two london locations and one location outside of London in Birmingham which is an interesting place to put something like that in it um, and Crystal Palace headliners are ASAP Rocky J. Cole and Tyler the Creator ASAP Rocky is like a mainstay at wireless don't know why to be honest especially because he doesn't release much music so he's going to be 
performing stuff that's come out you know a few years ago uh, I don't know you know you see Rocky once you see him once you know that's it basically J. Cole I would love to see live actually I think that would be a good experience Tyler the Creator of course would be amazing live especially when you've seen what he's done now on tour I saw a clip of him recently where he's basically been you know uh, he's got he's got some sort of gizmo where he's been able to take that boat that's on stage and parade it through the crowd that's been pretty sick to see so that'd be fun in Finsbury Park the headliners are Cardi B Scissor and Nicki Minaj which is really interesting uh, so they're co-headlining on the same day even though they both hate each other in terms of Cardi B and Nicki Minaj, I'd imagine similar to like rappers who have beef at festivals, they're going to try their best or make sure that they have them in separate places, not near each other, different ends of the venue. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they don't even see each other unless they go on stage and see who's performing. I have a feeling it's going to happen that way. They won't even see each other if they're at a venue, especially if the hate is still there. Because if I'm not mistaken, didn't Cardi B get that knot on their head, that lump? off the back of the beef with Nikki, right? I'm sure that was part of it. So I'm, I'm sure it hasn't changed. And, you know, women, when they come to women beef and, you know, they don't they don't really forgive too easily. The, the sick thing would be if on the day they just ended up performing on each other's, oh, I just clocked. The headliner's in blue, isn't it? The headliner's in blue. So that's the headline, the main headline on the shows. So the headline in blue in Fisher Park is Nikki, even though Cardi B's name's first every other listing is has Ace of Rocky first and this one Birmingham has Dave first but then on Finsbury Park they have Cardi B first even though Nick is a interesting it maybe it might be up called though no it isn't because S and N who knows well guys let me move on Birmingham um, headliner is Dave and alongside that is Cardi B again and J. Cole again that's why I love some, I don't like sometimes they repeat the things but you know because it's uh, outside of London uh, date it makes sense maybe to do that um, especially because they want an opportunity to see those people and then the rest of the artists on there are stacked there's so many good ones I'd love to see Snow Allegra Alive Play, Playboy Kai of course Louis Vert seems to be getting booked at shows despite again the the difference in terms of it's really as similar to fashion right similar to fashion it's really important which is why every day now i seem to kind of understand more and more why Kanye was screaming and telling sway how 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 about making his own stuff and talking about being you know endorsed by companies and having manufacturing and talking about Stella mccartney and vivendi and all this stuff the reason why he was going on such a rant is because he knows if you have the right people behind you the right power players the right production the right management the right whatever it may be it really does make your life much easier if you're a creative because all you need to focus on is the creation because there's always going to be an opportunity for you to be booked for shows, get deals, collaboration, put out product. You're always going to be able to. Enough is going to, because if you don't have that reputation, if you get cancelled, little things kind of affect your deals. So if you have a public spat with your spouse and it doesn't go well on the public court of public opinion, that could affect your deals. If you maybe, you know, do something bad at a show or you have a negative reaction with somebody paparazzi that could affect it like beef could affect everything could affect it but if you're established and you've got real backing behind you you can just it could just it could just it, it's like it never happened so Leo Ziver could convict again I love the guy but let's be let's call a fact a fact look at the difference between him and Tory Lanez he's actually been Leo Ziver actually got convicted in the court he got you know he got given probation he has to go do flipping sobriety and all this shit and mental health stuff whatever right um, and he's still performing shows, whereas Tory Lanez had to essentially take a career hiatus and just do his own thing and put out stuff himself. But essentially, the industry, you know, was about hands off because he allegedly might have shot Megan Thee Stallion. It's quite crazy in it how different it is, but it does make me then realize why Kanye was going on so many rants about needing manufacturing needing people behind him to do this do that it makes more sense anyway it continues those people on there like deep look ari lennis baby keem would be cool to see live Jenna, you could be cool to see live um maybe not that performance da, 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 da. the other interesting thing that's interesting especially when you think about the lineup and this the size of the people megan the stallion is like a supporting act she's not like one of the main headlines even though she's the one that's got the grammys like how many grammys has megan the stallion got megan the stallion Grammys. Uh, excuse me? She's got, is that how many Grammys she has? She's got one, two, three, four, five, six Grammys. No way. This lady's got six Grammys. How many? How many Grammys? Oh my 
Grammy stands. 26 Year Olds is now one of the world's most famous. Has free Grammy Awards. Free Grammy Awards. God damn it. Yeah, anyway, she has free Grammy Awards, right? But for whatever reason, she's still one of the supporting acts on there. Even though I don't think anyone else on this list, but maybe with the exception of Nicki. I don't even know who, if anyone on there has a Grammy. Does Nicki Minaj have a Grammy? I don't know. Does Nicki Minaj have a Grammy? No, she's got no Grammys. Nikki's got no Grammy. But somehow this, I don't know how this works. The industry is so weird, isn't it? That's why I think that, honestly, the industry really effed up. They messed, they messed her up, I think, Megan, man. She should have never got that prop just off the back of that shooting. They should have gave her the awards based on her talent if she was actually good. Um, now that they've kind of put her in this corner, she's in the company of people that she shouldn't really be in because her ticket sales are dead. No, she doesn't, not ticket sales. Album sales are not that great. The music is crap. It doesn't really resonate for the most part. It doesn't seem to be someone that everyone seems to kind of run to as a personality and stuff. And obviously the recent controversy isn't helping, but yeah, man, that's a bit strange. One. That's the only strange one I saw on there. But yeah, apart from it, loads of really good ones. I'd love to see Flo Midi live. That'd be sick to see. Um, Gets, of course, would be awesome to see. Rema would be good to see. Rico Nasi would be good to see. And then you've got um host. You've got the host and the DJs, I think, here. I don't know who these host people are. The only person I know is Snoochie because I've seen her around my area actually from time to time getting on a train. So there's any person that I can recognize, everyone else I don't really know. But yeah, um, wireless tickets are out. I think some of the days with Nikki are sold out because obviously she's the biggest draw on there, especially overseas. She's huge in the UK. So, you know, people are going to be loving that. Will I go? Probably not. Will I watch the videos and have immense FOMO? Of course I will. Of course I will. Um, then to move on quickly, yeah, let's talk about this one. Um, this is courtesy of Mixmag. This is a quick article. Um, courtesy of the DJ called uh, so I have you say her name again. Is it Sarah or so Sarace? Oh, I forgot. How do you fucking say her name? My bad. I completely forgot to say her name. Let me see if I can get up on here. Uh, how to say. Yeah, is it go? Sasha. Sasha. Okay, Sasha. Is that her name? Sasha. 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 Okay, cool. So this DJ called Sasha um had recently a residency at Phonics, right? One of my favorite clubs again in London. I think were um, similar to like XOY in these places. They kind of get a bit of a bad rap because they're a bit commercial in terms of their programming. But I think when they do do these kind of residencies or particular nights, they do have they do pull in some pretty decent people. The parties are usually pretty good, usually a decent crowd. The only issue is it because it's in Brixton, me being in East London, boy, it's a bit of a mish to go down there. But in terms of actually a good night, I've kind of be honest, I've not really ever had a bad night at Phonics. I've got to be honest. So um, I was keeping in mind to go to her residency because I think the last one I think was high maybe somebody else. I forgot who else was before that. No, maybe be just for James. But it's been a few there. They've, and they've done this kind of long-term residency thing where the DJ will be in charge for basically the an X amount of weeks back to back. They'll include their friends or bring friends along. But it's a great way to kind of see somebody, especially if you want to kind of see how a person plays back to, for the long sets, which are not something that's really common in the UK. It's mostly a, a European thing, especially Berlin, where you'd go to a club and you see somebody play for like an extended set, six, seven hours, especially if they're a resident. And it's a great way to kind of party, I feel like, because you get... Um, a way to kind of grow into the night of course as a DJ so we'll get ready for you to also play stuff that you'd probably never get to play in the dance floor because you usually have to come in and do the banger set of like 12 to 1 1 to 2 2 to 3 whatever it may be right um, but you get to play you know an extended set you get to play some interesting stuff the punters get to hear you go take them on a bit of a journey and if anything it turns into a less, less of a sloppy night because you can kind of pace yourself a little bit more so I love it and of course me being a DJ myself I feel like it's great to just see people, especially it's great to see clubs at that level, like the Phonics one, like the actual established legit club doing something like this because it gives me hope that maybe in the future other clubs will follow suit and someone like myself an opportunity to kind of play these places because unfortunately the only way to really create breakthrough as a DJ, especially if you don't produce, 
is to have residency. Like everyone that's kind of broken through has had some sort of residency, whether they've been brought in by somebody, whether they've played at an open deck, someone liked them and they brought them in. But you have to have the opportunity to play in front of people, a, a kind of captive crowd, they give good reviews of you, you maybe hold their attention, the bar spend goes up, whatever. Something to prove that you're good, but you need the opportunity to get there first. And to get there, to get behind that deck where she's standing now is so difficult because the talent in this country is just like this woman isn't even English. I mean, she's Irish and she's a flipping beast. So imagine you're competing competing with her being Irish and being sick you're competing with people here being sick and it's just you're competing with people coming from overseas overseas being sick it's just too much there's too much competition and for whatever reason the clubs don't seem to be able to know how to kind of balance the mix between big ticket people and local people it's a, it's a big thing it's a big thing but anyway regardless I really like this report this little essay or report article thing that she put together for mix mag where she basically details her kind of you know entire residency and how it felt and how it went down and i'm quickly going to read some of the posts to you accompanied by some pics and videos um this is a picture of her sitting down with some friends and fellow artists and people in the industry i guess having a dinner and doing the doing the, the, the madness before a gig or after a gig I mean, before a gig imagine it says here definitely one of my favorite parts of this job as she holds like what's that thing called is it a, what's that thing um, with a coffee what's a mix of the coffee in, someone knows it screaming the cost of the coffee um definitely one of my favorite parts of the job is educating my taste buds from all different cuisines around the world making the effort to meet the promoters and listening to them talk about their cultures and nightlife gives you so much better understanding of the dancers atmospheres and issues they face and all the different nuances that come with running clubs and festivals it's interesting that she made a point of, of say to say this making the effort to meet the promoters and listening to how much they talk about culture and nightlife are there DJs out there who don't meet the promoters? Like that's what I thought was a standard procedure in DJ world. Like you get booked to play somewhere, especially somewhere that's not your, you know, it's not your, it's not where you're based. You travel there. They maybe pay for your flights and you meet them before the gig. You have a din, you have dinner. Maybe you have a drink, and you just kind of run through things, have a chat, catch up, whatever. It's just kind of nice to touch bases, shoot the shit, industry shit. I just assumed that was what everyone does and maybe it's a, just a good way for you to even to if you're a real if you're a real flipping tie ass it's a great way for you to get a free a free meal out of it right why not do some people generally some of these generally not like to meet promoters what they do they just what don't answer the phone ghost them and just turn up at the event like why would you do that part of the whole reason why is to i don't know like wouldn't that be fun just to meet the people that kind of booked you and say thanks and show your appreciation i don't know just the etiquette thing like a you know manners thing that's mad isn't it um, i wonder if that's a thing people like there legitimately some djs don't want to, i guess it depends if you're like a really big time person who maybe imagine if you're not doing a residency like she was maybe you're coming into play at phonix but it's different in the uk because uk is the, no it doesn't really work in the uk because i was going to say if you if you come to uk and you've got two gigs back to back imagine you're playing at phonix one to three and then you've got another gig in the uk from like four to seven or something you might not have time to have dinner because you literally have to kind of, you know, you're flying in from Paris and yeah, you know, I mean, there's no time, but I don't think that's true because we don't have that kind of 24 seven nightlife culture in the UK. It doesn't exist. Um, most clubs close at seven, eight and those clubs that close at seven, eight don't book other people to come on at like four. It's not a thing. The main people come on between the hours of like 12 and 6 AM and that's it. Um, it's only one person plays and then the rest of it might be someone resident, uh, but maybe if you're in Europe, it's different, especially in Berlin. You can definitely be able to do like three sets in a night, maybe play, you know, somewhere 10 to 11, I mean, 10 to 12 and then do one place, one, two, whatever, blah, 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 blah. But that's crazy. If people do, don't just don't want to be out with the promoters. Like, fuck that. <laughs> anyway, con continues here. We got a DJ here holding a taco. It says as follows, gluten-free tacos at Bar Borkira, which is a restaurant I'm assuming, before me and Peach got started. A good uh, but slight meal is essential before a long night. I try to avoid the big carbs when they drop um, those triple cooked chips on the table. Who could say no? I have to also admit, also for me, again, smaller scale because I'm just playing in local bars and pubs in my area. But whenever I have played out, I tend to not eat at all similar to when i go to the gym i'm not somebody that likes to have a meal before i go to the gym i tend to like to go fasted even if it's not super fasted like maybe you had my last bite to eat you know 
the night before at like 8 p.m. or something, right? Not crazy long length of time, but still, I'd like to go with an empty stomach. Same with when I go to a club. I don't want to eat, eat, but also I don't want to have my belly can be completely empty. So I might make a sandwich, might grab a salad, you know, have a shake or something. But it's not like a meal. I can't sit down and actually eat. But I know some people do like to have an actual munch before they head out so they can somehow, you know, limit the effects of the alcohol or the drugs or whatnot. But I can't, I can't do that, man. I can't. That's too much for me. Another picture here, quite cool one, her alongside the DJ Peach. It says, um, fed, no, yeah, it said fed, watered, and ready for our six week back, a six hour back to back, standing in front of the Phonics um, DJ booth. I love playing with Peach. We always have a naughty giggle, um, and cheeky whispers. There's a real change in the energy in the dance floor when you're DJing with your best mates. The fun you're having together is infectious, and the dancers really buzz off it. I've, I wonder for the audio files out there, because this is similar to what I've noticed with Fold and Berghain. Fold obviously when it first opened the sound system was impeccable really good super loud it used to vibrate all over the place but I'm assuming over over time maybe complaints have come in from the council and they've maybe had to change or limit the sound somewhat it's okay no problem because it's still pretty good the system but it's not as good as it once was but then Berghain is interesting because it's concrete also and it's flipping amazing acoustic wise like you know i'm sure they have an, an amazing team that fine tunes that system every single day or people who are hired just to do that or whatever but i think for the most part if you've got a regular club would it be advantageous to just have it be wood flooring or somehow in that regard so that the sound is that dumb to say it vibrates or it kind of carries better or maybe it holds a warmth whatever is there something to be said for that like because i'd imagine maybe concrete wouldn't be the best place wouldn't be the best kind of material to use if you wanted to create a nightclub maybe you want it want it to be a mixture of concrete and wood i don't know i wonder if that is but who knows but because I, I always like the sound system at phone i don't think it's that different to any other club but i wonder if it's a consideration they put in place to kind of mitigate for the volume restrictions they have i don't know who knows cool picture here behind the booth and you get to see some plaques what they put in the booth which is quite sick featuring the other djs who played there in terms of having a um what should we call it a residency you've got jasper james hi jasper james might be the first one isn't it? Yeah, jasper james hi uh, who's there who's obviously a dj from ridley road market but that's what i know from well again one of the only few djs in london who was able to blow up from a residency most people don't get the opportunity you know whatever happens happens it's annoying to me in that regard because people like myself don't get the opportunity to play these places but you know we continue um but yeah she's absolutely smashing it now she's a legit like a star and then we've got a person here called essa who i'm not really too sure who that is is that essa or something or tessa i'm not too sure but yeah that's a cool picture oops oh man let's go here come on come back again yep oops uh yeah let's scroll down a bit it's too much yeah, so they're behind a booth. The caption says as follows. Uh, someone stopped by to give me a little reminder of who the OG Funnels resident is. And I best not forget it, of course, featuring Hi. Then there's a clip here behind the booth featuring a sick tune I'm going to play. Hopefully it doesn't blow the speakers too much. It says a sexy little Madonna edit from an amazing producer called Bodin. I've been hammering this one out for some time now. Guaranteed showstopper. It's the due to re it's due to release very shortly. But more importantly, be sure to check out Bodin's back catalogue. Some really killer club tracks in there. I bossed. Uh, sorry, I bossed. I bought most of it. Great view from inside the DJ booth. The hallowed DJ booth. The DJ booth that some beg for. Like, I wonder. Is there anything worse than DJ groupies? People that beg and plead to get behind places like this and want to hang around and skip drinks off the rider and all. It's just like, have some self-respect, says the guy that, you know, requested a wristband to go into the fabric green room. But we move. Let's play the clip. Let's play the clip. <laughs> Ladies with an attitude, fellas that were in the mood. Don't just stand there, let's get to it. Strike the pose, there's nothing. Ladies with an attitude, fellas that were in the mood. Don't just stand there, let's get to it. Strike the pose, there's nothing. Sick, sick, sick. Um, another one, see uh, behind, I guess, at home, organizing tracks and stuff. S saying the following uh, this face is utter where the fuck do i start when planning an all-night long set i usually bring two bags of records and maybe have about 50 digi tracks prepared for it um this is time no this is time you get to experiment with those weird tracks you bought but never 
when you when you'll play take risk be bold for sure yeah it's easy for you to say lady all right you get to play for six hours in one of the best clubs in london some of us only get to play a couple of hours in some spots you know lastminute.com we ain't got time to experiment and play weird tracks we have to either hear at the park keep people on the dance floor or we don't get booked again <laughs> do you know what I mean we don't have that we don't have that privilege uh, we continue this is her outside is it was she wearing a pair of rings there oh no no i don't think so but um we're outside phonics looking cool with dj bag already she says as follows feeling bit sweet at the start of my last show phonics thinking how did it go so quick why did i drink so much i don't want it to ever be ever be over but my back is sore um they do they like my new jacket hey ho and the picture of here signing of the bag another one playing a clip too and i said wobble i've been playing i'm not gonna play the other, other track i'm just continue but yeah um cool cool stuff regardless i really recommend you check it out i wish people more artists did something like this similar i guess you have to you know take pictures and be mindful to kind of jot down your memories or remember what happened how you felt on the day might require a bit too much work but i think this is a good way to kind of sell the residency especially if you're phonics too it's a great way to sell it because whenever they announce the next one people are going to be down for it i think it sold really well if i'm not assuming as well if i'm not um assuming wrongly i remember seeing a couple of, uh, of the events sell out on ra i think the guests weren't too crazy it wasn't like she was bringing in seth trucks i mean she was bringing in just friends and stuff and it was selling pretty decent so clearly people really love her as a dj and really think she's good at what she does so that is definitely great and you know i'm sure this has definitely made her a better artist going forward so yeah props to her in general and um, props to phonics for doing the thing and continuing on and i'm eager to see who the next resident will be b let's move on from that quickly and let's talk about some stuff on here that i thought might be of interest uh yeah let's talk about this let's go here yes go here let's go here let's go to this one so this is courtesy of hype beast um obviously um as you guys are aware i think i think the hype no the off-white show was today um sans obviously um virgil being around due to his passing and it looks like Off-White have outlined what their plans are in terms of how they're going to approach the brand and how they're going to approach collections and whatnot going forward, you know, with um, Virgil Abloh not being around at the moment. Um, it says as follows, in a report per per purchased, sorry, in a report by the Business of Fashion, Off-White and its parent groups have outlined the future of the label founded by the late Virgil Abloh, making the future as a next chapter, marking the future as the next chapter of Off-White. The outline share how the influential imprint NC harness a legacy following the death of the icon on last november it's november man time has gone by so fast in it really like you blink and it's like it's already march we're heading into april crazy in it man r.i.p to the goat um the report highlights the unstoppable creativity of virgil abloh as his label will carry out his endless number of ideas that he left in a whatsapp conversation over the years which is really cool the whatsapp group conversation thing which even after admit, at the time that I was working with him with that online course that I was doing, I remember a lot of the people in the management team were really annoyed that he wouldn't really get on the phone or do a Skype or do face-to-face -face meetings because even then he wasn't as famous or as flipping you know he didn't he wasn't even in charge of louis vuitton men's at the time um but he was still doing a million things at once you know running a bunch of 100 miles per hour all over the world and obviously the best way to communicate with him to get a response was to, for your whatsapp that's when they first started to do the whatsapp thing and really kind of get into it and a lot of the management team are really getting annoyed by it like why is he just communicate normally like email and you know zoom slack whatever it may be but now that same thing that was kind of and i'd imagine people in the industry some people probably would have said behind the scenes or behind closed doors oh he's not really a serious guy he's sending messages and shit sketching on stuff on below on his phone Do you know i mean i'm sure because people you know have these weird um, preconceptions whatnot but now th that same sort of way of working has now got to the point where they're harnessing it because there's so many so much flipping gold and gems and jewels and information and ideas in there that could essentially feed a couple of collections going forward which is crazy because off-white isn't some you know isn't some small collection isn't some small brand this is a brand that usually sells or makes a lot of clothes right not a lot of it's all great amazing don't get me wrong but they make a lot of clothes especially in a fashion show there's always like 50 plus looks so the fact that he's got that much content that much that many designs that many ideas you know just sitting in a dormant face whatsapp group is amazing really amazing and shows just how much of a beast he was and it's just definitely shows me the 
kind of similarities of course with somebody prolific like an artist that who i love who's my favorite kind of contemporary artist of all time or even contemporary artist it's an artist all around in picasso right and he was known for his kind of aggressive and over you know crazy work ethic in terms of the amount of stuff he was able to sketch paint and put together sculpt whatever it may be he left an absolute treasure trove of art right people are still finding pieces here and there all over the place that he kind of left and scattered around the world to a certain extent you know salvador dali did a similar thing but you know prolific you know picasso was at that peak and of course virgil now he's passed you, people no one can really dispute the fact that you know say what you want about his finesse and his precision and the quality of his work whatever it may be but in terms of position he's able to put himself is he did it through just pure force of nature because he just was aggressive with the with the uploads aggressive with the sharing aggressive with the content generation with the idea generation with the execution that's the main part as well he actually didn't just put stuff on line sheets it was actually made real right it was actually tested in real time um put in front of people whether or not they laughed or scoffed at it like it's pretty sick man really really sick it continues here says andre grilly who served as off whites um chief executive officer back since um back since two, why are they write like that since 2019 noted the next two years we're going to be full speed the full being poured into the brand for its decades Wow, let's read that again for the next two years we are going we're going to go full speed the fuel being poured into the brand is for decades for centuries wow virgil would have wanted us to do it he always said that it has to be a multi-generational brand our kids need to go to rodeo drive and rue saint honneur i guess it's a um, really bougie street in paris and see it which i agree with i think that's what he did really well in terms of being able to uh, you know appeal to the high and low um it didn't always work but i felt that approach especially for a newer brand Brand. he didn't always try and market to the fashion elites or the snobs or the people in the know he tried to go for regular consumers who just might pop into selfridges and see something they like and want to cop and for people that are going to try and seek it out in a boutique somewhere which is great he continues touching on the succession of off-white the label is expected to adopt a collective while remaining open to the other routes to adapt to ever-changing landscape of fashion um so it says it's going to be a group of people and the movement collective said david di Giglio, a co-founder of new guards group the parent company of off-white yeah i think think about linux open source you can inject something new and so and software pattern evolves the new guards group um they french to the, yeah you know what i i'm sure this was something virgil said because it sounds very virgily right to talk about linux and open source and all that stuff but i have to be honest i don't like this i think you have to decide either it's a collective and you do it as a collective or you do it under one person's vision i think personally they should decide who it needs to be and have it just be that one person and maybe have it be like a sort of like what diesel was doing for a bit was it diesel who did this someone was doing something for a bit where like they had a, a designer come in like a guest designer and then they kind of you know they let them do it for a couple of years and someone else comes in do that maybe do it for four years you have somebody come in for a four-year run they kind of and again it would be a great way to also give people an opportunity who maybe would never get a shot at being like the artistic director of a big flipping fashion brand that shows during paris fashion week that is backed by a major production company or whatever in terms of new guards group and whatnot right and has you know many stores around the world why not just go and use the um, what's that fund that he has oh, i forgot the fund that he has where he's kind of mentoring and giving money to um kids from underrepresented communities and whatnot or black and brown kids right maybe have that maybe have that be like a funnel a kind of where you can kind of bring people in to off white and then maybe you can use those people to be like the main heads of leading that creative charge for a four-year run and then you basically change it every four years and you announce it as a big thing and it kind of becomes like a a weird school to kind of go through like your testing grounds you get to kind of dip your feet in and become like a designer and work in fashion work in the industry maybe you might not go and start your own brand but it just give you an idea of what you want to do right and you get to present on the biggest stage that'll be a sick thing to do but we get someone's singular vision like if at most a duo i don't like collectives i don't got to be honest i'm not really a fan of the collective i don't think they work um very rarely do they work in fashion i think it's either a singular vision or a duo vision that's it and just kind of stick with that and go forward and i think that'll be a great way to honor his legacy honestly it'll be like a literal breeding ground in the school for people to kind of go in show their best work um be able to kind of touch people influence add to the legacy of the brand and essentially it makes the brand like everlasting 
right? Because there'll never be a, there's never going to be a generation of kids who will grow up and see the videos that Virgil did, some of the videos I've got on my channel, and and not be inspired and not want to also get involved and not be kind of inspired by his story, everything, right? So you look at have a never ending stream of amazing applicants coming through from all over the flipping world wanting to kind of show what he meant to them or be able to kind of show their talents on that stage considering that they come from unrepresented communities areas whatever be that would be sick that would be so so sick but more likely than not they'll try to collect a thing it probably won't work and then they'll get someone famous to come and do it you know i know you know what i mean it's a business at the end of the day they gotta make money but i would love to do it that way if they did it before but you know what, what can you do um then it continues here da, da, da. Uh, oh, this is here. Um, Louis Vuitton chair. So interesting point here. Louis Vuitton chairman and CEO Michael Burke cited a similarity between the current situation at Off White is similar to Dior. Man, imagine only when he's passing, they're saying this. Man, when he was around, no one was comparing Off White to Dior. You say that, and people will laugh at you. Anyway, and went through after the death of Christian Dior in 1957, it says as follows, quote, If the legacy is rich, authentic and steeped in values that go beyond fashion, the odds of turning a, pass a passing into something eternal are spectacular. Yeah, but Dior went to through some troubling times too, and you know what I mean? Dior even now at the moment with that, what's her name? Um, with that lady at the moment, you know what I mean? Like she's making some absolute trash on that runway. So let's not use Dior as an example. But anyway, um, Off-White did present their um, show also, um, the Fall 2020 show in Paris. There are some bits on here that I really like, some bits that I didn't. But the biggest thing to come out of this was the video of the actual show, amazing. They had Jeff Mills doing the music, like, <sighs> Like he's, he's set up like in, what's that video? That iconic video from back in the day where he's got the flipping NPC machine, not NPC machine, whatever machine that he uses on the floor. And he's kind of squatting down and, and there's these massive speakers that are perspect clear, obviously, you know, in the, in the style of Virgil. And he's just oh, going to town, that thing, like amazing to see, really cool. And this massive chandelier in the background, like the setting was great. And I'd imagine for his friends, and colleagues and whatnot and people that are really close to him and family it must be better bittersweet as hell in it because this whole show was like because the thing i would imagine with the whatsapp group how they're going to continue his legacy it was so you could tell the show was really informed by virgil's taste and what he left behind and maybe messages he left to people whatever maybe or maybe the work that he did you could just tell it was and it must be so bittersweet to be a friend or somebody close to him or a family member to be there and him not be there at the show. Him not kind of popping out at the end, running around, holding someone's hand, you know, kissing someone in the audience, bringing uh, kisses, whatever he did. You know what I mean? Like, he's just not going to be there anymore. You don't get to see his outfit at the end of the runway. Like, it's just such a sad thing in it. But it's a great to honor him still. Do you know what I mean? And they're all the flipping stars show that as well. Loads of really big models, some of who I don't really know, but some who I do know. Loads of great looks here and there. I'm a big fan of those are really exquisite women's looks I thought that were really cool. I've always said, anyway, Way. off white women's was always the standout compared to the men's i thought the men's wasn't the strongest i always thought his vision of how women should dress or what he likes to see women wear or whatever was really interesting for me it was always kind of a little bit it really stood out in terms of what was available in terms of what was presented during Paris fashion week especially because that's like the pinnacle of i think um fashion weeks and whatnot you know this vision of what a woman look would look like in virgil's head is like amazing you know what i mean like a like a down jacket on top of a classical dress with some heels i'm sorry a classic dress sorry with some heels and a slit in the front like you know you might not like it but it's still a very unique way of like kind of seeing what women would kind of be dressed like i'm still not a fan of these sort of uh that what's, what's that thing called the harness but i do prefer for this shape oddly enough more so than the other one um again the harness legacy man that's gonna be long in it that legacy and i also like this logo that he developed over the, recently over the years as well this kind of like a um, logo with like the cut out holes that kind of looks like a piece of cheese i thought that's a great way to kind of instantly notice an off-white piece instead of the kind of x thing the kind of hazard warning sign whatever it is um some great stuff here yeah look look at the women stuff like the, the virgin idea of women or off-white food is just really cool i always thought it's really impressive um really really big fan of it some of the accessories are great big padded jacket the hat is pretty impressive as well i think kind of giving me um vivian westwood vibes there as well um this obviously was pretty sick um on all white look number 22 with um holding a flag that says question everything that looks amazing look at it that women's look is flipping cool with the combat pants 
Like, so excellent, man. Really, really, really cool. This look is one of my favorites, number 28, especially with the model um, skin complexion, the color of the outfit. It's just, oof, it pops. There's nothing better than really bright colors on darker skin people. I know that. It's a, it's a secret hack. It really is. I wear lime green. I wear this sort of canary yellowy, limey color, and I look amazing. It doesn't matter what you wear. Really, really cool. The only thing that's weird, I think, I remember, I wonder if women could comment on this. Is this always normal to have heels where the toes are so, like, out like that or is that because it's just a runway model shoe and they're not going to be in production like that it's too it feels too sparse for me here there's not a lot of like i mean protection or cover maybe i'm just looking into it wrong here yeah, it's a bit too open and sparse but yeah apart from that i love the all really cool looks like look at that look how good that looks again yeah again the toilet is just too out maybe it's a, maybe it's meant to be like that. i'm not too sure but yeah um some cool looks here let's see another one that i look oh yeah this is one of my favorites as well this went so hard number 35 look all brown with this amazing big fur thing uh kind of his interpretation of i guess a, a regular classic sort of dickies carhartt uh double need um overalls you know you got a you got a turtleneck jumper there with the massive hat. Like, I love it, love it, love it. Especially if someone like with a big head and big hair like myself, that hat is going to be a godsend when it eventually does come out. Another look too with that fur number on. Bit of a repeat of a look, but I do like it nonetheless. I think the trousers are maybe a little bit different. The pants, got some off-white Nikes on there. Look number 38. And again, another brilliant look for women. Like, you might not, it might not be your style, but his version, his vision of what a woman looks like is really one of a kind in some respects you could say it really really is man let's not let's not let's not lie here i thought this was really cool with the you know face i'm surprised not many other instagram baddies have done this actually they've you know girls like to do that whole face card because they've got a really cute face and upload it onto instagram i'm surprised no one's painted face card with quotation marks underneath their on their underneath their eyes then of course you've got serena williams looking incredible as well on here she looks really good really really good much better than that other show we saw it was that shoot she did recently where she was looking a bit weird yeah the stripe hanging off here doesn't look the best but overall she looks great in that outfit there number 44 I forgot who this lady is she's somebody i think senior known she looks cool as well got these kind of um what they call these ski snowball boots that everyone's wearing at the moment that looks cool i think i'm have to actually try to see if this works for me and my style and grab a couple of these snow boots but i think it might be I think it might, it might not look how I want to look in my head. I want to look like Pharrell, end up looking like a foot, but you know, I might try. Again, a really cool look with a camo. This I thought was a really great representation or synthesization, or if you wanted an example of what the codes are for Off-White, I think this would be it. Look number 47, which is essentially a classic gray blazer charcoal gray maybe there's some additions here and there the lapels are a little bit different shape wise you know buttons there you've got a nice little pocket with some great accessories in terms of the paper clips and then he's got a kilt worn i guess over the trousers or maybe it's built into the trousers um classic length holding one of the bags right so everything's kind of been tweaked and twisted here and there uh per his um design ethos i forgot was it, his three percent or whatever thing that he said but i think this is a real representation of what off-white is about as a brand if there was one image that could kind of be used as a template or used as an example of how to basically to, a, a starting but not point to leap off from if you were going to take over louis um sorry off-white i think look number 47 will be the one really would it looks so cool and it's probably done the best this is probably the best iteration i've seen of it this is even better than um, Virgil's Met Gala look was it Met Gala that he did where he had the kilt thing this is a much better representation of it I think in my opinion um, and then you see Capo Jim Jones walking the runway it's just sick in it Jim Jones if I'm not mistaken also it's funny because when Virgil was alive it felt like he was I wouldn't say chasing after the Virgil club but you know he was always in the comments making it known he likes the stuff but you never really saw Virgil kind of reaching back out too tough apart from maybe the odd time here and there maybe there's a bit of distance there maybe he got too many requests from rappers and whatnot I understand that regard but he did um but it's quite nice to see it kind of come around full circle do you know what I mean and him be able to kind of show the love and be on that runway and look pretty decent on there too but I thought this video that was uploaded um or that he shared of himself getting kind of you know um touched up and whatnot behind the scenes was really cool because clearly you can see even though you know jim jones is super popular super you know famous and 
you know, whatever it may be, and has had access and done many things that most of us could only dream of, he was still kind of geeking out that he was, you know, basically being, you know, doted on and was being treated like a legit model behind the scenes and was in the world that he kind of maybe didn't think he would ever take part in, whatnot. It's just really cool to see. Honestly, it really, really was nice to see. Let me see if I can get it up on here. I think it was courtesy of Glock Topics. Let me see if I can find it. Bear with me. Yeah, it's here. There we go. So it's Glock Topics has got one. And where's the other one of him? Okay, there's one of him getting a nail thing done. But I thought this is the funny one though still. The funny one was this one. This video where he's behind the scenes. Let's play it. I'll play it. I'll say this. Is this, yeah, this is this is a Jim Jones talking behind this behind this uh, backstage at the Off White Show in Paris. I'm, I'm just gonna say this. When I finish this joint today, you heard? You can you can add uh, runway runway models in my joint. You heard? You heard? Holla at us. The only thing that made me laugh about it was Alton Mason. Bless him, right? He's probably one of the most famous, well recognized amazing models out there regardless of race right he's just fucking smashing it, especially when it comes to men like he's just smashing it and he's been smashing it it feels like for a while it feels like it's been a five-year run this guy's been just like hitting him over the head year after year after year um but he's clearly in my head trying to you know pretend or act somewhat straight here because obviously jim jones got this video and he's kind of just flexing and doing his thing you know doing the whole these johers and you know acting like a you know acting like a lad and then you know alter masons in the background trying to you know be one of the boys too and it's like bruv like, just be yourself man there's no need to act up in front of the boys and pretend you're part of the man demi i mean like we like you for who you are do you know what i mean that's always the thing usually in ends i always especially when i where i grew up you know if there was somebody gay in our community or in our area or in our community whatever you want to call it people would run some jokes here and there cool because we're boys and we just want to be silly but for the most part if you're cool you're cool and people just got over it and moved on but no one wanted you to pretend to be like the man them and start doing certain no just be you and people would like you for who you are they don't want just you to act one way just because you're with that group because you want to just act more straight but i guess also it, it's kind of unfair to say that especially if you haven't come out yet right i mean i mean it's a bit unfair i don't know i'm throwing stuff at him but i'm not talking about alton i'm just saying in general it must be difficult for a dude if you are gay and you do have friends who are just more you know who are more cis in their kind of attitude or whatnot or it's incredibly hetero or bro -y, which is a term i always hate you probably do similar to me you do probably um you know without realizing you do kind of code switch and change up how you move based on who you're around because you just want to you know it's human it's human nature you you, you want to survive you don't want people to be mean to you you want to have a good time you don't want you know what i mean why be why act all you know faggy around your straight friends if you know it's just going to cause trouble just chill in it and then you can act faggy with your faggy friends why not you know i mean it's, it's no big deal um but yeah i just found that interesting as a video i really did find that f pretty funny <laughs> out to the, the back trying to be like one of the guys like yeah you heard tell them tell them you know i know he's from new york so he probably does speak like that anyway but it was just funny to see him try to act like one of the lads <laughs> hilarious but yeah r.i.p virgil man the goat um the absolute legend uh you know legacy still kind of carries on again look at that look alton's wearing that like, look at that look that is another quintessential virgil look in it phenomenal mate and varsity jacket is that two jackets over, over over it is that two jackets on two jackets is that like an ma1 and a varsity over the kill and the trousers and the chunky derby boots like come on come on it's not fairer but yeah, the whole collection was sick. You got Bloody Osiris wearing a really cool camo number that looks like it's been made for him um, with the banner claver on holding the flag, question everything, which I think is a great omen to actually. That's something I've been thinking about myself in terms of my DJ quote unquote career, in terms of how do I approach it? Because, you know, in general, I would like to play out more often, but I'm also very aware that I kind of enjoy my life, but I do like the opportunity to play out more places. So I don't want to turn into a legitimate full-time DJ playing crazy venues all over the world, but I would like to play in some of my favorite clubs. So imagine you have the ability to be like a person that can play in like 20 locations, you know, 17 times a year or whatnot. I don't know, whatever it may be. That'd be pretty sick in it. And I'd be able to maybe says maybe you can you might not be able to live off that, but that's still a pretty cool hobby to have, 
really will be so i'm trying to think of how i need to approach it especially if someone doesn't produce that myself like how do i put myself in the shop window you know what i mean and what better way to kind of have that way of thinking by looking at that flag and saying question everything um it continues we've got um who's a, what's his name is it ian i Shea or something i forgot his name how you say it um he's a singer he's there also you've got of course hadid looking a little bit weird i'm not gonna lie the outfit i'm not really a fan of it looked like they gave her shoes that don't fit right or am i or am i bugging looks like either she's got really big feet for her who she is or these shoes aren't her made for her size wise but regardless it doesn't really cares we continue a couple of looks here towards the end i wasn't a fan of joanne smalls there wearing this crazy outfit with a snitch thing she said something really weird on instagram as well the other day post show about haters and girls and stuff else i wonder who that was about and who knows we continue boom 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 more stuff this this kind of camo thing was a bit weird but this sort of not camo thing what would you call that camouflage chewbacca the thing whatever looks that was a bit strange but apart from it, it was pretty sick the, only, the funny thing was again the memes coming out of kendall walking because she's got a terrible walk watching the videos of this was really wild as well as well because some of the walks were really bad like really bad but I guess it was part of the show to be a little bit loungy, you know, walking around. And I like the fact that, I don't know if it was on purpose that they get, made a hold of Pepsi in lieu of what's happening in your world. Maybe that was a cool little tongue-in-cheek sort of thing based on that kind of viral meme that went around when she, was that a tattoo they put on her face? Written stuff, I don't know, but yeah. That was a cool little, I thought, look. And the dress also is pretty decent with the look, that, that, you know, a black sequined mini skirt dress, whatever, with um, little black dress written on it is perfect. Really, really is perfect. Um, I don't like this look with a skateboard. I think any skateboards on the runway should be burnt and thrown out the bin. Gerber, I think her name is right. Or oh, mum, Naomi Campbell's there. Another person to Honey Dijon looked amazing in the runway. The class Kai Gerber, I think the daughter, she, she had a terrible walk. When you see stuff on video, it doesn't really hold weight, I think, as well. But apart from that, I think the whole show was a great way to kind of honor his legacy. Everyone showed out, everyone looked amazing. And, you know, Paris Fashion Week is back in full swing. And then um, the final look there, I forgot the lady's name. She's meant to be a very famous, legendary model. But again, I'm not really too au fait with models and whatnot. But people were really going crazy for her online in terms of being really excited that she was the one closing the show. So big up her and big up Virgil and big up everyone, you know, that's basically trying to keep his legacy alive. <laughs> Moving on from that, quickly went to mention the only other thing that was kind of lame i guess was part of the clout and the hype and i guess because he passed and touched many people and people are maybe back outside again because i guess paris restrictions of going outdoors and covid and whatnot have kind of been loosened i think life is back to normal if i'm not mistaken in paris again if i'm wrong let me know but i think it is so it made this paris fashion week feel like the old days right where everyone was out showing out eager to see eager to please and for whatever reason it looks like this off-white show was a real big ticket item like people were queuing outside like fans like spectators to take pictures with people and it's just disgusting yuck 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 yuck, yuck. i don't know why you do that like why are you doing this like have some self-respect and also there's nothing special about these people that are at this show like the, the show is special you know seeing people create fashion shows at that frequency to that quality season in season out is amazing to see but the people that surround it are of no interest in terms of celebrity in terms of freaking out really not yeah you can comment from them uh, about them from afar and double take their pictures and maybe check out something they're wearing but in terms of leaving your house to go and fan out like this this is like gross in my opinion really gross um so this is a couple of pictures courtesy of um, vogue it says phil um courtesy of the photographer phil oh phil O's best style photos from paris fashion week four they do this all the times like a little slideshow collection of pictures let's stop this autoplay nonsense i hate autoplay videos burn in hell um so yeah let's zoom in here see some of the pictures what my one of my favorites was this obviously rihanna and Kurt, um, sorry can't you, rihanna and asap rocky outside of the off-white show um i love that he's wearing an all hoodie with that embroidered on the hood i think that's pretty cool i'd wear the hell out of that to myself the video is even better of this because they're both just looking like cool and nonplussed and not giving a fuck and just just a cool and this is probably my favorite look of hers in terms of being pregnant korean as i thought the others have been a bit again who cares what i think but i've not liked the others i think this has been my favorite i'm not sure if she's wearing um frank ocean jewelry here maybe she's maybe she's not but they both look great 
there's a picture here of the new creative director of um, Supreme, Denim Tears, and I think that's ASAP Nast, you know, doing what they do best. I think hanging around looking cool. You've got Bella Hadid there. The outfit, I think, is terrible for me. Personally, again, who do I know? I'm wearing a flipping poncho that I bought from flipping Mexico City five years ago. That probably stinks. And, I'm, you know, look at me, whatever. I get it. But there is such a thing as skinny privilege. I think when you're skinny, which is what I'm trying to get to, people will allow you to wear whatever like you get you you get far more people turn the other cheek or have better impressions of your outfit if your frame is better it just is what it is and because she's got a, you know a spectacular frame um especially during the fashion week she tends to kind of lose a little bit more weight and she just tightens up all over the place she's great incredible i'm sure there's a lot of hard work involved in it too but let's not kid ourselves the look is trash like this tartan dress thing with the leather gloves and these weird quilted knee-high boots like come on bruv this is like yowzers bruv like this is like something you'd see some italian girl out on some erasmus course wearing do you know what i mean like come on it continues here some cool kids outside again these are the kids i think that left their house i guess to like get some content and stand outside of shows but and they're younger and way cooler than I am, but there's nothing cool about this. Zero. Like, leaving my house and what? Chasing clout in real life. It's bad enough following these people on Instagram. You already feel like a bit of a loser. You're following people you don't know because they dress well. Like, what are you doing? Let alone going to these places in real life and standing there and screaming and trying to get their attention so you can put it on an Instagram story that no one will care about or get a picture that no one will see. Like, oh. Naomi Campbell looking cool in the off-white dress with the jacket on. I don't like this all the time. You know, the help always have to wear the mask and whatever. And the celebrities come through maskless and live their best life, you know. But it is what it is. You got some cool Asian dude here wearing an off-white bandana and something else there. You got the other Hadid sister, more fans around. Um, some other cool looking people. I don't know who this person is, but she looks great. I love that outfit. I love the lady again behind too. She looks great. Yep, love that. What's that say? Did that teacher say nigger? I don't know. <laughs> Another group of, you know, nondescript Caucasian people looking cool as other fashion show. Uh, another guy who, you know, again, I don't know. Not found out. The girl behind looks great, though. With the tabbies on and the socks and this kind of ruffled thing number. I don't know what these, I don't know what the brands are. But she looks great from behind there. She looks incredible and she's got really great skin um going to continue don't know who this lady is but she looks terrible uh yes i'm aware she doesn't have any legs but she does look great let's continue tracy ellis ross looks cool denim jacket off white off white jacket so denim jacket off white bag this is pocket like cool amazing um someone here wearing the stussy um what to call it varsity jacket everyone's got that i really like too that's nice i forgot what her name is it kylie close i think that's that girl that there another cool looking black guy not really fan of his outfit oh she looks incredible i don't know who this is but she looks really good real good outfit then turquoise she looks kind of cool as well here some other caucasian dudes pointing and smiling and wearing glasses um mother and daughter modeling and looking great uh, that's that Jin, what's her name? That's that influence, what's her name? Something Manili Manelli. I don't know what her name is, but she looks cool. We got Paul Pogba in the house with his wife, looking great, spectacular. Great to see him out and about. Athletes always look so good in suits, and look how much he fills it out. No homes, but you know, they fill out the suits so much better than you know twinkie models they're safe for the most part but they look so good um again more people looking cool look at that look at look, look at this look at this image. look at how horrible and lame this image is right number image number 24 if you want to check it yourself out 43 there's some person i don't know who this person is i guess the editor famous person i don't know somebody notes notable who's wearing a jacket made out of bubble wrap okay um and she's taking pictures with random people smiling it's like how much of a loser do you have to be to do this? Like, leave your house to stand outside of a fashion show. I guess maybe because they were showing it on the screens outside. So maybe it's an event. Maybe that's why. I don't know. But either way, I'm not leaving my house to go and stand around the show and have fun. I'm not doing it. Like, it's lame. These people aren't celebrities. They're not. I'm sorry. 
there may be people that you know who work in the industry who maybe have some clout and have some followers but in terms of leaving your house to go see them what for why some lady wearing an i support black woman t-shirt maybe she's part of the off-white um team and whatnot or that group or charity that oh, virgil put together i forgot what it's called we won't say too much on that one don't get cancelled you got some fun young kids hanging around on steps doing f this is something that you always do when you're fun young and have you know, you know i think about when i see stuff like this do you remember that jordan woods um video where she was explaining what was it red table where she was explaining what happened between her and tristan and the Khloe kardashian backlash and whatever i remember one quote that always kind of rings through my head that kind of we're just young fun having fun young fun having fun you know that quote that's what i think of when i see people like this i just think of that like when i was that age like you know you just every like just cackling at the nonsense things having fun swapping saliva hanging around dancing looking cool in clothes like just the best life the best don't get me wrong you don't have much money you're scavenging on stuff you're you know you, you never buy your own drugs you never buy your own drinks you get given loads of free stuff because people just think you're cool and you might make them help them sell stuff you know it's a bit of a dirty life but it's true you know you know exactly where you stand you've got a cool group of people who all, you know because you kind of share clout and you hang around each other they want to help you it's just nice isn't it and then you get older you just become expired <laughs> and you're sat here in a poncho <laughs> talking about people <laughs> attending a fashion show love it um again more cool looking people uh that's bakar i think the artist i think i don't know what he's wearing but he looks you know, up and down as he usually does but makes good music so we just move on that one all oh, my nose we continue um we've got outer mason looking fucking incredible this this man bro like what does he do to his skin where does he get his shape up? So like, he just looks so fucking good, mate. But I'll assume someone like that doesn't drink too much, doesn't party too much. You know, if you treat, if you was to treat being an influencer or being a model or being somebody around the scene as a job, this is what you should look like. You should work out aggressive. Again, I think he's an athlete. If I'm not mistaken, I think his brother's a, like a college basketball player. Really good. If I remember seeing on his Instagram one time, picking him up, I'm pretty sure. So he obviously comes from a family that, you know, works out and is athletic or whatnot. Maybe just whatever. He's probably got a good base. But I think if you really treated being a face, an it person, an it boy, an it girl, a socialite as a job and less as a fun thing to kind of get fucked up and hook up, this is what you should look like because you should spend every waking moment of your life wanting to perfect and harness and refine and elevate and whatever, whatever you are. Do you know what I mean? Your looks, your working out, your frame, like just every time was a, you know what I mean? You'd probably, you'd probably change stylists every couple of years because you wanted a fresh, different, you wanted a fresh kind of makeover and look or whatnot. It'd be so cool. And legitimately, you're, you, you you can do that because you're legitimately at the top of the food chain. So you're, you're getting a lot of money. You're sustaining yourself. You don't have to go work a regular job. So, yeah, man. amazing. That's a real life of opulence. You know what I mean, being paid, like, look at this guy, like, look at me like, that's a perfect human. It really is close to perfection. Got Kendall here looking pretty cool in her dye job. I think she looks great with this kind of gingery kind of color. I don't know who that is behind her, but it's probably a friend, some models, some i think that might be i don't know who that is is that unknown t that is unknown t isn't it yeah 32 probably unknown t oh you got the og my my favorite guy um tyrone from rick owens he one of the best represent he's probably one of the best examples of how to wear rick owens really well him and of course rick owens himself and of course michelle lamy they wear rick owens so and of course michelle lamy's daughter too she always wears it really great but he's one of the best like he's always dressed immaculately i'm a big fan of um, tyrone he's always got great rings on as well or oh, oh, silver nail polish i like that might have the cat not gonna lie might have, might have to copy that one um i'm not sure who that guy is is he a writer or something isn't it i'm sure he's some sort of writer but if ever there's an image that would scream like i work in fashion this would be it in it because who else would wear something like this <laughs> what is this like a is it like a blanket that's got ma1 sleeves on it i'm sure it's very expensive and very trendy but just looks hideous with like what what is that like a bandana god almighty but yeah big up him though oh yeah she looks incredible i love that i love this she looks really cool yeah that look is really cool that reminds me of somebody that would see a flipping infernos or something that is really cool she's out to party and she's out to show out we go on i like her braids i like the bag i like the jacket yes you look good this looks really cool too just oversized blades with the hat i like what that look 
you know, some other image of nondescript cool Caucasian people smiling and opening their mouth. I'm not sure showing the black girls, but she looks really cool. I've always wondered why more black girls who are like, you know, who are who look like this don't get seated more of this sort of like athleisure sort of type, especially designer stuff like this stuff looks so good on them like the hair and press and stuff this off white sort of stuff it looks amazing on them like really cool i don't know why we don't maybe i don't i just don't see it on my timeline but yeah oh you got honey d john on the outside here looking cool there's actually a book about her that i meant to buy soon that i want to check out hopefully another lady here holding a bag looking cool i forgot what his name is i think he was part of no vacancy and i forgot his name he's out there with a beard looking cool i guess with a tartan jacket on but yeah cool everyone's cool oh yeah and that's um that's the dude that was that what's his name justin something right designer at some brand and he got kicked out in like record time i wonder what happened there again what happened there he got appointed the designer of some italian fashion brand because he was doing really well in his own namesake brand and whatever reason he left really quickly but i never tell you why was it because he was you know racking up lines in the office you know <laughs> with whatever or is it because he just didn't like the work i wonder what or maybe because you know he maybe had something personal happen i don't know but regardless um people waiting outside shows and queuing and screaming at people that are walking out i think is lame in my opinion i would never do it i, I, I can't ever do it but because it was an off white show you kind of have to allow it in there but anyway that has been the Agassino Zingo Show episode number 561. I need to cut it off because I've got to go to bed. But thanks again for listening. It's been a pleasure to have your company. It really, really has. If it's your first time checking out the show, of course, you know what to do. Help me out in all those places. Leave remarks and all that good stuff. I'll be greatly appreciated. Of course, we've got, I've got a Patreon. We've got, who else is here? <laughs> I've got a Patreon where I have to upload an, a bonus episode per week one. So if you want to check that out, please do at patreon.com for Um It's only $1, the equivalent of one pound to check out. So don't delay, get on that today. And that's about it, isn't it? If you listen via the audio podcast, you'll hear a song as you always do. My kind of song of the week or song of the day, whatever it may be. And if you're listening or watching via the YouTube in the background, this is just how it's going to end. Peace. Take care.